Boy, I don't know if we need a sermon after that. I think we can, we can call it. I, uh, I'll be honest with you, we, if you're new here today, it's your first Sunday here, I just want to say you picked a great day. Um, we're a passionate group of people about what we believe, and it's not because we have checked our brains at the door. We have investigated it. We've looked at the research. We've studied the word. We've looked at this. We've experienced it personally, and, uh, and we're, we're walking testimonies of that here. So we're glad you're here to be a part of that. Um, I, uh, I got to tell you, the highlight of not my, just my summer, but maybe my whole life uh, is, you know, when your kids make the decision to follow Jesus. And uh, just uh, this past uh, month, uh, Adeline, my four-year-old daughter, through the help of the leaders in Discoveryland Hortonville, Discoveryland at, uh, Appleton, uh, together in the Sunday school there, she made a decision to follow Jesus uh, with the rest of her life. Yeah. And that is, the, that is the product of your prayers, uh, your generosity, your giving, and uh, the leaders down there that helped lead her to that. And uh, she made that decision on her own, and I'll be honest with you, that's the gospel. It is not complicated. Uh, a child can believe it. Uh, it's a simple enough for a child. That's what probably makes it really hard for us as adults, is it's, there's got to be more to it. It's got to be more complicated. That the God of the universe who has this moral standard would let little kids in and just run into the kingdom and believe it. Yeah, the answer is true. It's, it's that simple. It's, it's simple enough for children. And uh, so she's all excited. So she's like, what, is this, what next? And we're like, well, you got to be baptized. And she's like, what's that? And we realize like, she has a, she's deathly afraid of going underwater. <laughs> she's a four-year-old girl. You know, she's like, I don't want water on my face. So, she, so we, didn't, we didn't know what to say, uh, and we're, we kind of didn't tell her. We just, we just said, oh, you know, we'll talk about that later. And I'm thinking, like, what do you do? Do you just do it anyway? And just, you know, the trauma of that moment, she'll never forget it, right? Like, she'll remember it. So maybe, <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. <laughs> I'm a good dad. Uh, we'll explain it to her at some point. But it is a step. It's not uh, the only commandment that Jesus gave. He commanded a lot of things. And like every commandment, it's for you. Jesus doesn't need anything from you. He doesn't command you to do things because he needs minions. His commandments are a gift to you. He's trying to show you and tell you the best possible way to live. They're for you. And just like this, this is a commandment. It's not the only one. It's not even the most important one. Jesus told us what the most important one was. It was to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. But it is a commandment. And so we are obedient. These people have been obedient to do it. And uh, I'd invite anybody else who's a believer to consider taking that step to obey their Savior uh, to do it. Well, um, let me uh, start out with this. Today, um, we're going to talk about a really obscure passage, uh, and, uh, but I want to begin with this truth. Uh, this is kind of going to be the, the, tr the truth that kind of sets the tone for this morning's message, and it's this. Um, you were saved not just from something. You were saved for something. And it is a fight. It's a battle. And the Bible talks about the nature of that battle, that it's not against people. If you're new here today or you're spiritually undecided, you're not a Christian, our battle is not against anybody, any per person. In fact, in Ephesians, Paul says, our battle is not against flesh and blood. So as long as you have flesh and blood in you, our battle is not against you. The cross was not like a weapon that Jesus brought against you. He said, I didn't come to condemn, I came to save. I didn't come to condemn the world, I came to save it. And Jesus is no hypocrite. Uh, God is no hypocrite. He doesn't say, you know, my, your battle is not against flesh and blood, but mine will be. That's not what God does. He's not a hypocrite. So his battle is not against you as long as you have flesh and blood in you. It's for the things that try to rob you from an intimate, real, honest relationship with him. And he saves you from a lot of things. Um, but if only your, the, if your only theology of salvation is that he saves you from something, then you will spend your entire life in a waiting room for whatever it is. I mean, you'll, life will be a waiting room and it'll be just waiting to get to heaven to cash that ticket, you know, to avoid whatever the hell that he saved you from, right? And man, Jesus says, I came so you might have a full life. Life to the full. A full life is not a waiting room. I've been in waiting rooms. <laughs> They're not awesome. There's some old magazines that are well outdated, right? That's not what life is. But also, uh, if you spend your life uh, like that, uh, you, you miss out on this reality that God actually came to save you for something. There is territory he wants to take. There is victories he wants to have and accomplish. 
And he actually wants to, he chooses to use you to take that territory. Your gifts, your personality, your background, your story, your resources, however small or big you think they are, he wants to use those to push back darkness and evil and take more territory for good. And that is an invitation from, I mean, think about if the president called you and said, hey, I need you to do me a favor, you'd be like, whatever it is, right? You were like a big deal person, right? You'd think if someone, the CEO of your company would call you and say, hey, I need you to do me a favor. Big deal. Creator of the universe has called you. It says, I want to do something through you. It doesn't matter what it is. You would drop everything, right? Well, this is, this is not only why God saved you, but it's the talk of our message today. And I want to dive into a passage of scripture that talks about this fight. It's an obscure one. It's one that probably if you've read it or you've gone through this passage of the Bible, it, there's a chance you'd read it and go, well, I don't understand that. So I'm just going to assume that that's not for me today because <laughs> it's kind of obscure. And let's just dive into it. It's in, uh, it's in 2 Samuel chapter 23. We're talking about David. This is the last of the series. And this is the passage, chapter 23 in 2 Samuel. Once during the harvest, when David was at the cave of Adullam, the Philistine army was camped in the valley of Rephaim. The three who were among the 30, an elite group of Navy SEALs and special forces in David's fighting men, they went down to meet him there. David was staying in the stronghold at the time, and the Philistine detachment had occupied the town of Bethlehem, which was David's place of birth. That was his home. David remarked longingly to his men, Oh, how I would love some of that good water from the well by the gate in Bethlehem. So the three broke through the Philistine lines, drew some water from the well by the gate in Bethlehem, and brought it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out as an offering to the Lord. The Lord forbid that I should drink this, he exclaimed. This water is as precious as the blood of these men who risked their lives to bring it to me. So David did not drink it. These are examples of the exploits of the three. That's kind of an obscure story. Um, David is our series we're finishing up. You can't talk about David without talking about his warriors. Reason being is he was a warrior king. In fact, it's such a part of his story and his identity that God actually said, David, you can't build my temple, my, my, my house, because you've got too much blood on your hands. I've called you to be a man of war. Your job is right now, your calling is to push back uh, the enemy that has invaded Israel. That's your job. Your son Solomon's going to build the temple. He is a man of war. You can't talk about David without talking about his warriors. And David's got 30 of them. And actually, they're all listed. You can read their stories in the rest of that chapter. But he outlines the top three here in the story we just read. These are the top three. It's amazing what they accomplish, right? You have David, you know, wanting some of this water. They fight through the Philistine lines, bring it back to him, and he just pfft, dumps it out, right? That's a cursory reading of this would be very confusing. So this is what, this is actually the context, right? David is at this time in the story, not, not the, the chapter. The chapter he's recounting an old, an old, an old war uh, story. And back when this happened, when the story happened, David was not king yet. In fact, when he was in this cave of Adullam, uh, we have some of the psalms that he likely wrote from that cave. They're all despair. He's despairing. Why? Because he's not king yet. He's a fugitive. Saul is chasing him. Saul is hunting David. And all David's done is try to please Saul, right? He's tried to serve in his army. He's accomplished a lot. He's, he's fought the Philistines successfully. He's killed Goliath, the great Philistine giant that everybody was afraid of, that all of Israel cowered from. He's doing all the work. He's serving King Saul. He's doing everything he's supposed to do. And he's being pursued. He's a fugitive in his own land. So he's, he's not home. He's home, but he's not home. And so when he says he wants some of this water, he's not thirsty. What he's saying is, is Bethlehem, my home, and I'm supposed to be in my own country, in my own home. My own, I'm supposed to be king. He's already been told he's going to be king. And he's a fugitive. He just longs to be home. He's just longing to be home. This is no different than anybody here maybe in the middle of winter in Wisconsin, in May. We would say, man, I just wish I was at a brewer game with a cold beer. I wish I was sitting at, you know, on the back deck with a glass of lemonade, a cool glass of lemonade while the warm sun on my body. I mean, that's, that's what he's saying. He's just wishing for a, a time and a season of life. He's wishing for home. He's just being nostalgic. He's not actually thirsty. 
And his men hear it as such, and they go, our king, our leader is despairing, but we need to, we need to show him that he's got nothing to worry about, that it will not be the case, that he will have a home in this land, and we need to show it to him, and we're going to go get some of that water to prove it to him. So they cut through the Philistine lines. They climb up to the top. Bethlehem sits up higher than where they were located in Adullam. They climb up this mountain, cut through the lines, and get the water. Just imagine being a Philistine. Okay, you're fighting off one of the guys. There's chaos in the ranks. They're cutting through your lines. Just the, it turns out it's just three guys. And then you see one of them over there just by the well. <laughs> Getting water. What a weird moment, right? And then the chaos is all done. They like, the guy runs down the mountain with the water. And they get back. And I'm, I'm a Philistine. I'm looking down that well and I'm thinking, what is in this well? This must be the fountain of youth, Right? That they would give up, they would risk their lives for this thing. And then David gets it, right? And you're like, this moment, right? These, these guys put their life on their line, and then he just, he just dumps, it out on the, dumps it out on the ground. This is what David is saying. And this is the only message, the only point for today, only one point sermon today. And this is it. Every victory, every victory in your life, Every drop, 100%, not 99, belongs to God. It is not your hard work. It, it, David is telling his men in that moment, he's saying, listen to me. A stray arrow, you slipping on a pebble on your way up that mountain, anything, and your life is done. It's over. It's not your sweat. It's not your hard work. Listen to me. This is so important. You need to get this. This is where you need to, you need to come out those doors having put a stake in this truth in your life if you want to make it through the fight of life, if you want to make it. 100% of your life and its battle belongs to God. It's not your hard work. I mean, think right now of the hardest thing you've ever done that was successful. Think of the toughest thing, the thing that cost you the most sweat, energy, resources, financially, thing that cost you the most time. Think of whatever it is that cost you the most. 100% of that victory, that success, 100% was God. Listen, you could have been born blind on a mountain in Tibet and no amount of hard work is changing. You can't choose where you're born. You can't choose that you have been given oxygen in your lungs to do it. You, there are good people, much godlier, smarter, and stronger than me, that have come down with something, some physical illness, something, and has sidelined them from whatever it is they were trying to accomplish. There's nothing. There is nothing I can take credit for. Where do I see that in the passage? Look at, look at this moment. Try to put yourself in the skin. Any other king getting that cup of water from that well would have been thinking this. Wow. This is not a cup of water. This is a cup of power. This is a cup of glory. This is a cup of influence. My influence, my charisma, even my, my character, my moral character, my selfish servant leadership, compelled three of our nation's best warriors to put their lives at risk, to fight through, to cut through the lines of a Philistine army, to bring me back a cup of water. That's power. That's glory. And what does David do? He doesn't take a drop of it publicly. He doesn't touch it could have drank all that in he doesn't take a drop of it and he doesn't give it back to the men either he doesn't say this is you you earned this you did all this you should drink this not me he doesn't give him back the glory either because he knows one stray arrow one slip on a pebble and they're done he doesn't let them take it either he doesn't invalidate thanks them he honors the fact that it was incredible sacrifice but he recognizes that even their grit, even their strength, even their ability, all of it finds its root, 100% of it, 
in God alone, and he dumps it out. He's teaching them the very, the, the, the very idea and the mantra that he has in his own gut in which he fights and has been victorious in all his battles. And he says it right before he fights the biggest of all, Goliath. He says it in 1 Samuel chapter 17. This is what David says, and this is what he does with that cup of water. It is the Lord, not me. It's the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear and will rescue me from this Philistine. It is 100% God. I'd spent uh, a couple weeks ago, I spent a week with a bunch of missionaries. These, about 120 of them. If you know any missionaries, um, there's a measure of sacrifice, uh, especially the ones that go overseas and bring their kids and their family into the, some of the darkest places in the world. Um, you know they're, 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 they have a special call. And there's a, it was humbling to spend a week just teaching them the Bible. I'm like, these people are living it out in sacrificial ways I'll never know. Um, if you know any missionaries, that's the case. Pastor Brandon, your lead pastor here is a missionary. Carissa, if you know her, she was up here with me. She was a missionary in India. These people, there's a measure of sacrifice it takes to do that kind of work. And I was with him for a week, and I met one of them who's three years, three or four years younger than me. He's, uh, he's got three master's degrees, one of them from an Ivy League school that if I said the name, you'd all recognize it. He's got three young girls, three little beautiful girls, um, four, six, and three, I think. They're very little. A beautiful wife. They're a wonderful family. He can get any job he wants in America. The guy's got three master's degrees. He can do whatever he wants. But he chooses to serve and teach at a seminary as a professor in a, in a country I can't tell you out of concern for his safety. Um, and uh, the decisions he has to make every day about, what, about going to work, we'll never know. And I think those decisions would be the things that we would be afraid of, right? There's a lot of things that he has to deal with that are concerning, that, that we would maybe say are terrifying to think about. Um, in our, I was just doing a cursory um, look on the internet machine, on the interwebs, and trying to discern what the top three fears are in the world. And... Um, they're very interesting. The reason fear is something I'm, I'm, I'm talking about right now is because if you believe that even a fraction of the fight depends on you, if it's not 100% God, then you're either going to be overconfident because it's all you or you'll be terrified. You'll be fearful because everything depends on you. If you slip on one pebble, if one stray arrow catches you, if you put your foot in the wrong place, it's all on your back. And the top three fears I can think of right now that people might be wondering about, might be afraid of, because in their minds, it's all on them, has to do with illness, right? right? We're in the middle of a global pandemic. Let's just state the obvious. It might be even some of the other fears or the way you know, you're being told to mitigate that, that, that virus or that illness. You think those are kind of scary too, some of the things you're being asked to do, whatever. And some of the personal freedoms, right? The, the, the personal privacy and freedoms, those are, those are things people are afraid of losing, right? Those are the three big fears. And honestly, all of them find their root in what I would call wise and healthy concern. The Bible tells us to be careful about how we live. It says be very careful, actually, is what the Bible says. And, and there's a healthy level of concern you ought to have about your body. You ought to do as much research as you can about what's good to put in your body, what you should be doing with it. That's a good thing. If you don't care at all about your body, I'd go, hey, you should probably read this. God only gives you one. You ought to be a good steward and manager of it. He tells you to do that. Be wise. Have healthy caution. If you don't care at all about people's, people's rights and freedoms, if you don't care at all, then you don't know the God of, who cares about justice, who cares about setting people free. You ought to read this. You ought to have concern for those things. But when it's all on you, when, it's, when, when, when fear takes over, then these things become not just wise concern. They become your master. Wise concern becomes fear when it's the most important thing. When you don't have the freedom of knowing that God has 100% of the battle. He's got all of it. I don't have to worry about my personal safety. I ought to be concerned about it. I ought to do as much research as I can and study it and look into it. But I don't have to let it have the final say. The final say in my life is not fear or even those concerns. They're a factor. They play a role. But they're not the final say. The final say is my commander on the battlefield and the call of God on my life to get in the fight. This missionary, uh, his daughter, four-year-old daughter, on the way on her bus ride to school was shot up by an AK-47. She was okay, but that was on her ride to school, on her bus. 
the, uh, the place that he works, the seminary, was car bombed. And the pastors that he trains, he knows more than half of them statistically, will return to their country and will not die peacefully in their sleep. They will be killed for teaching people the Bible. And every Sunday, he has to decide if he's going to go to church and take his three little girls to church. And they put on their pretty dresses. They put on their dresses. They get ready for church on a Sunday. And he has to make a decision whether or not to get in the car and drive to that church because he knows there are odds that say there might be men with AKs that are going to walk in that sanctuary or walk in during their Sunday school. And every Sunday, he has to make a decision. Am I going to go and worship the Lord with my other believers? He doesn't have the luxury of deciding that based on how he feels, if there's a little bit of snow on the ground, if there's you know, some inconvenience of just parking and crowd size. He, has, he doesn't have the inconvenience of that. He has a much different decision to make. And he looked at me with tears in his eyes, and he said this. He says, Brian, my own family. He says, my friends, people I love, they look at me and they look at what I do with my family. And they think I'm crazy. They think I'm reckless. But I have learned this. Your personal safety, you're safe. You are never more safe than when you say yes to the call of your Savior to do whatever it is he's asking you to do. You are never more safe than when you are in the very center of God's will. Since when has personal safety, as important as it is, as much as God commands us to be concerned about it, ever trumped the call of God on a Christ follower's life? Look, we will get hit by a stray arrow. There will be some stones that roll up into your family and and you slip on them. You'll be, I mean, as a parent, I have a four-year-old. I'll watch them slip and fall and somehow they miss the coffee table, right? There will be these random accidents, these things that happen. And listen to me, you'll walk your life through fear if you think somehow it's all on your shoulders to avoid everyone that you can. But you are set free to run into the fight Because your personal safety is not your king. And you can trust it to somebody who loves you. Who gave up all of his personal safety for it. For you. You can trust Jesus with it. And you can know that because 100% of the fight is his, that you cannot add a minute to your life. No thing, no good diet can add a minute to the life that God, the time that God's got for you. And nothing, not one thing, can make it a minute shorter. You can run free. You can run fast and hard into the fight, whatever call God has for you, with that kind of freedom, because you can trust the one who loves you, the one who gave up all of his freedom, all of his safety for you is with you and owns your fight. So what is your fight? Some of you are in sales. Some of you are in marketing. Some of you are in business. Some of you are teachers. Some of you are healthcare workers. And God has placed you there. And he's allowed it. You, couldn't have, you could have got out of it, but he has allowed you to be there. 100% of your journey, he's put you there. And it may not be the same next year. He might move you. He might be using some of the factors right now to move you to a new call. But one thing is for certain, what drives your decision What drives your motive to say yes to the next chapter of your life, your profession, whatever that is? It's not personal safety. It's none none of that. It's the call of God on your life. Because you don't have to, you're set free from having to worry about that stuff. You don't have to worry about that. And the most dangerous threat to you and your personal safety and whatever that is, is you. When you say no to your Savior, Jesus, and his leadership in your life. And I'm going to be honest with you. Some of you are going to make decisions that other Christians might disagree with on that. Some of you might hear me saying, like, okay, like, I don't have to worry about my safety so I can stay in my job and do this and do whatever they require me to do. Some of you are saying, you know what, I don't have to worry about my personal safety and my livelihood so I can give up my job and do this because I don't have to worry about income because God's got me. You know, some of you are going to apply this differently. But here's what all of our common ground is. Here's what we can stand on as believers is our motive. It's our heart. Which fortunately, according to the Bible, and it's in the, the first Samuel, we're reading second Samuel, what first Samuel tells us is that the world's going to look at your outsides. 
other Christians even might judge you by your outsides and what they think your decision should be on, your, on the outside. The good news is, is your creator God, he only looks at the heart. He's only looking at your motives. So listen to me, be honest with yourself right now. The decisions you're making based on the concerns that are in the world. We'll say no one in here is afraid, right? We'll just say it's people out there that are afraid, okay? We'll just say that. But the concerns you have, are they rising to the point where they're dictating your decision? Are you truly choosing to go this way or go that way in your job, in your family, in your life, in your livelihood, in your decisions? Truly, are you doing it because you're saying yes to a call? knowing that 100% of your life is on God's shoulders, not yours. And you're just saying yes to a call. Is it truly that? Because be honest with yourself. If it's anything other than that, that doesn't matter. God will look at you at the end of this life. 10 out of 10 doctors say we're going to die at some point. 10 out of 10 of us are going to die. It's going to happen. And at the end of the life, the only thing that God's going to care about is what your motives were. Look, I've made a lot of things that the world would say are good decisions, and I've done them for all the wrong reasons. That I was selfish. I want to look good. I want to look morally good. And in God's account ledger, zero, donut hole. And I've made some dumb decisions, but for all the right reasons. And in God's ledger, that's a plus. Be honest with yourself. Is fear in charge? And if it is, ask yourself, is it because I believe somehow that this life and this fight is on my shoulders? A hundred percent of it, every drop of water and every drop of blood belongs to God. It's his fight. David never commanded this of his three. Did you read it? Did you see it in there? He never commanded it. Never. He didn't say, go get this water. He didn't ask him to do it. They just heard him longing for it. If Jesus is nothing more to you than a commander, you know, this is what religious people, religion does. Jesus is just a commander. He's, he's not a friend. He's not someone I love. He's just someone, a necessary evil for me to like avoid hell or avoid bad things in my life. Maybe he'll give me good things if I obey him. Um, if Jesus is just a commander, then you have to wait for him to tell you specifically to do something. You know, he didn't command me to go be generous with my money or, my cause, or, or to a cause or a, to a neighbor in need. He didn't, he didn't command me necessarily to give to that amount. I haven't heard him tell me to give that radically. I, didn't, I haven't heard him to call me to serve in ministry specifically. To, he hasn't called me yet to, desert, to serve in a specific ministry. I don't know what it is yet. He hasn't really called me and told me to necessarily go tell that person about Jesus. If, you're, if it's just religion for you, then yeah, fine. Just wait for a commandment. But I'll tell you what, Christ followers, people that actually know what he gave up, people that know what it cost him, they don't have to wait for a command. Just like those three, they just have to like accidentally walk in and hear on what he longs for. They just accidentally turn to a page and realizes, oh, Jesus longs for people to be concerned about the widow, the outcast, the orphan. He cares about that. Well, I'm just, I'm just going to go do it. We're going to cut through the gates and go get that done. That's what people who love Jesus do. They don't need to wait. They just need to know what his values are. Some of you have been asking, I don't know what God's will is for my life. He hasn't told me yet. Well, why don't you just start? <laughs> why don't you just start with looking at what he cares about and get involved in it, whatever it is. Because again, he doesn't care about your decisions. He cares about what drives them, your heart, what motivates you. And if your motive is like, Lord, I don't know if this is the right job. I don't know if this is the right call for my family and my livelihood, but I know in my heart of hearts, I'm doing 100% of it because I know it's what you long for. I know what your values are. I'm going to do it. This is, you got to love him. And the only way you get to that place is if you know what he gave up for you. The only way you can do that is if you know what you have because of what he gave up for you. And I'm going to end this whole series with David and Goliath because that's what we remember of David. And David and Goliath points to the answer to this question, this problem. And I, I don't normally do this, but um, I'm just going to read you my, my notes. and my, I do have notes secret. I do have notes, and uh, they come from my journal. I, I don't get up here and present research to you. This isn't like Brian goes and researches a passage. And this is stuff that, like, God's just doing in my life. This is stuff, I, I'm preaching my journal entries to you guys. This is, I'm not going to get up here and tell you guys to go do something I haven't been under the knife of yet. 
And so I'm going to read you my journal entry when I was journaling through this passage and David and Goliath. A couple things I need to remind you about David and Goliath. David and Goliath is a story about two champions. That's an ancient word. We don't use it. We use it to describe something differently today. But in the ancient world, it was very common militarily for them to say, hey, listen, rather than us both armies fight, you just send your best out. We'll send our best out. And whatever happens to them will happen to us. So if our guy loses, then we in, we're enslaved and we can, you will, we'll be your servants and, and you, can, you can kill us. If our guy wins, then we get to do that to you. Let's just save ourselves the trouble of a big battle. And David volunteers to do that. David goes out and says, I'll be that person. And this is just recounting David's, um, David's experience, but it's reminding all of us, and this is what David points to, is that's who Je- he's pointing to Jesus, the true champion of our faith. And in that story, if you remember, the moment David kills Goliath, the entire Philistine army sees it. And they are, they're overcome with courage. They're like, this is amazing. We've won. The battle is over. Let's go. And they storm out of those trenches and they slay all the Philistines and leave their bodies all over the place. And they take the field. And this is what I wrote just after reading that passage. I'm going to read it to you. This is not a story about me fighting like a hero. No, I am in the trenches cowering like a coward with the rest of the army. Unwilling to risk my life against what is my giant. No, this is a story about a hero fighting for me, a champion, a man in the middle. It is a story about a person who fights for me and then when what he wins, I win. What he conquers, I conquer. And what he inherits, I inherit. And what is completed, what is finished, what is vanquished, what is killed for him is also for me. And where on the empty battlefield the hero stands, I stand with him. We will never be like David, so give up. Stop trying. David never asks Saul to join him in the fight. He never solicits us in the trench to join him. We will never have enough brute strength. We will never have enough religion or moral core courage to slay the biggest fear in our lives. But here's the thing, we don't have to. We have a David. We have a David who walked out into that lonely valley in the shadow of death. We have a David who said, I will go. He did not bring brute force. Instead, he he did not bring the latest military weaponry. He actually powered down. He did not power up. You don't have to be afraid of your worst nightmare anymore because he's already dead. Are you afraid of humiliation? Jesus was humiliated and won. Are you afraid of a loss of love? Jesus lost all love and won. Are you afraid of betrayal? Jesus was betrayed and won. Are you afraid of physical pain? Jesus took on physical pain and won. Are you afraid of being seen as worthless when your life is over to the world? Jesus was seen as worthless when his life ended to the world and won. Are you afraid of losing approval? Jesus lost all approval and won. Are you afraid of being publicly shamed in front of your closest loved ones? Jesus was publicly shamed in front of his closest loved ones, and he won. But here is the Goliath, the battle we cannot fight, that our morality, our moral courage cannot fight. Are you afraid of the wrath of God, the punishment of God? This is probably the worst nightmare of all, just for a moment, even if you don't believe in God, just for a moment. It is, if, if this were to be true, this is your worst nightmare, to face God, a creator of the universe, your maker, and to try to give an account for all your lies, selfishness, and secrets that you're most ashamed of in your sin, and it's not enough. And then be banished to hell while watching the outstretched arms of your loved ones as you drift into unspeakable and endless torment and suffering. Are you afraid of that ever happening? That Goliath, he lays motionless, headless, destroyed, killed with his own sword, with his own cross. And Jesus stands over him, victorious. And he's holding out your victory. Do you want it? Your only job is 
to receive it. You were made to leave the cowardice of the trenches in this life. You were made to not sit in a waiting room in this life. You were made to run out bravely into the field, to fight for people, not against people. But only to the degree that you see Jesus standing over your motionless, lifeless, worst fear on your behalf, only to that degree is the degree to which you will run into the fray. If you're unable to run into the fray, something's blocking your view of your worst fear being dead on the battlefield. You'll run into the fray, chase the frail, small, cowering army through the rest of your life and leave a trail of bodies behind you until you see Jesus standing over the motionless Goliath in your life, which is our sin and shame. You will never see all the fears so small fleeing in such terror. End with this. Let's stand as we end with this, as we prepare to worship. How can you fear any battle on earth when you know the war has been won? How can you take the glory for any victory when you know how you got it? And how can you not charge into the fight when you know your true king and his love for you? Let me pray. Lord, in a moment, we're gonna worship you as the one who fights for us, who the one who we didn't fight, we were in the trenches, we were cowards. But Lord, today you've beckoned us to leave the trench because we can see clearly, you've opened our eyes, that all of our fears are vanquished, even our worst one. And we can run into the fight no matter what it is and serve you. Because Lord, you've called us to our places of work, you've called us to our families, not because you need more business people or you need more teachers or you need more healthcare workers. There's just people there that don't know this kind of love. They don't know this kind of freedom. And so Lord, help us to stay in the fight or to go to the next one, but help us to make all those decisions based on your call and your longing alone. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, let's worship the Lord.